Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this uh, lovely, for us, early spring, for everyone in Southern Africa, sort of early fall day. Um, today, I'm joined by Andre with Trans Africa Safaris in Cape Town and the well-known Derek and Beverly Joubert, uh, who will tell us a little bit more about Great Plains and conservation and what's going on right on the ground and how it's all been affected in this time in Africa as it is. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Andre, who's just going to uh, do a little quick introduction and then we'll take it from there. Andre. Well, thanks, Johan. As you mentioned, I think we're extremely excited and uh, privileged to have two icons in the, in the wildlife industry with us this evening. Um, you know, both Derek and Beverly have been active conservationists for over 30 years. Um, they're award-winning filmmakers, videographers, um, National Geographic explorers and residents. They've got a, um, a CV that's very impressive. And I think, but their main focus is really about um, conservation and looking after uh, vulnerable places in Africa and making sure that they're there for future gen generations. So both Derek and Beverly are co-founders of Great Plains Conservation as well as their foundation. And Derek is the current CEO of Great Plains. And they've got an incredible um, portfolio of um, bespoke lodges, um, all in unique locations. And uh, we'll leave the two of them to expand more on that. But um, yeah, I think, again, you know, we're just uh, incredibly excited to hear what they have to say this evening. Um, and the, I suppose your key focus over the years has always been um, you know, understanding large predators and how they interact with, with other animals um, in the ecosystem. So we look forward to learning a bit more about that. But um, yeah, Derek, I think uh, I saw it in one of your recent newsletters, and I'll just read it because it's uh, it's a few paragraphs. But uh, I thought it'd be a nice little segue to to start start our session this evening. Derek said, uh, I'm no numero numerologist, um, I'm gonna get my tongue around that, but I have some significant prophetic numbers that were around in my head. 36 is one of them. It happens to be the percentage of human land biomass across the planet. 36% human land biomass across the planet. When I read this, it was shocking that more than a third of all life across all continents is human. Then I focused on the next number, 60. Another percentage of the Earth's total life made up by livestock. We grow and farm animals that feed, feed the 36% of human population. And we do that in, in huge numbers, even chopping down forests to grow, feed for cattle to provide for us for our ravaging wild, wildland, removing predators that all compete for the same grass. But the real number is four. Squeezed out of the total percentage, game is 4% representing anything wild. Any wildlife has been reduced to 4% of the planet's biomass. So, you know, that is a, a fairly um, sobering uh, uh, statistic and perhaps um, somewhat alarming, but that's not our idea to create any panic um, amongst everybody on the call tonight. But I think it does, it is the reality and it puts everything in perspective. So I wanted to just, um, draw attention to where we are currently um, with um, natural habitats for wildlife. So Derek and Beverly, um, perhaps we can start with a brief overview of your organization and what regions um, Great Plains is active in currently. Well, thank you and welcome everybody. And thank you, Johan, as well. Um, those numbers that you were talking about are, are actually critical to who we are. Uh, as a species, um, how Beverly and I wake up every morning, and there's a thing that we tackle with. I actually think that most conservationists today wake in a sort of state of um, post-traumatic stress because we all wake up, we read about these numbers, and then we, we get locked into a sort of um, panic because how much can we do about that? So um, it talks a little bit to the foundation of Great Plains as well. Uh, a good number of years ago when we started, um, we employed some students, some postdoctoral students from um, 
uh, Duke University to have a look, and you spoke about the big cats, to have a look at where the big cats were 15 years before that, 10, then five, and where they would be five, 10, 15 years going into the future. We overlaid a, a human population growth map over that, and very quickly we could see where the pinch points were, where these big iconic species, not just big cats, were going to go extinct unless we stepped in. And that fundamentally is, is how we started Great Plains. We looked at key pieces of land that we could get involved in and could lease so that we could actually stop the human pinch against those corridors and divert that um, and make sure that these corridors were connected for the movement of these big animals. If you save lion pride, you save all the prey, you save a whole ecosystem. So we focused our entire lives on, on these big cats. And so the way that we established where Great Plains would be was based on these iconic places, these iconic species, the pinch points of now and in the future, and how we could, we could do anything about that. And of course, um, a, a large part of what we do, and, and you know, the, as you mentioned earlier, the, um, the core of who we are is conservation. And so we're always looking for how can one aspect of who we are assist the other side. So as Derek mentioned, uh, Great Plains is there to protect the land. And that's uh, 1.2 million acres of land creating corridors, keeping the corridors open. Uh, a lot of what we do is how can we look at vulnerable areas, iconic areas that are incredibly vulnerable, and how can we turn them around, how can we protect them, but also what can we do that is going to uh, be a better conservation method. So for instance, in the cylinder um, area, probably 15 years ago, we straight away stopped the hunting. From day one, we took it over, we had to uh, create um, an area that was going to be sustainable, uh, so working in a new way in protecting it, and that's how we started the cylinder reserve, and then a of course, uh, we now have three lodges in the area. So that was important, but roughly the same time is when we started the Big Cat Initiative. And that's at the National Geographic. We could see through all the work that Derek and I had done over a 40 year period of filming and working on the big cats, that um, the numbers were plummeting at an alarming rate, um, as Derek mentioned. And if you look at where lions are today, leopards are today, and cheetahs are today, we've lost 95% of them in a 50 to 60 year period. So that's a drastic decline. And what is the future? Uh, clearly the future when we look at, um, Derek talking about the pinch points, but deforestation and uh, you know what we are doing um, through animal trade, all the poaching, we're going to lose a lot more. And so the Big Cat Initiative was looking at how we could protect areas right through Africa, not only the areas that Great Plains is involved in, but right throughout Africa. And right now we are supporting um, over 150 grants um, in 27 countries in Africa. And of course, working with individuals on the ground, we're not involved in all the projects other than giving out the grantees, but we support them in every way possible. Each culture is different, the environment is different, and, and governments are different. So it's uh, looking at how we can be innovative to do conservation, which is an incredible challenge, uh, but a good challenge because we're bringing in communities right through Africa, and the communities are now the future conservationists as they embrace the way forward in protecting these areas. So that's just really giving you um, a side of how every aspect of what we do um, supports conservation, Great Plains, the Big Cat Initiative, and our foundation. So we're in, uh, we're in Botswana, Zimbabwe, Kenya, which I think is what your question was. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're in those three countries and uh, we have about 13 properties within there. And um, as Beverly said, over a million acres of, of land. Um, Great Plains is, it's funny, I, I tried to describe this the other day, Great Plains looks and feels and smells a bit like an NGO um, because it's all about conservation and communities and we use uh, tourism and tourism partners like yourselves 
to help us fund our conservation. Um, the only other thing I'd say about the charity is clearly you can see from, from Beverly here that I'm her biggest charity case. So I'm very pleased to be here today. <laughs> <laughs> Back to you. <laughs> there's so many, there's so many right. factors <laughs> that ties into that conservation cycle. And, you know, we got to stop the 4% from eroding further down and turn the wheel, turn the, the ship around and add more land. And you guys have been instrumental to that. Wonderful lodges in all of those countries. And there are many avenues and different things that feed into the conservation cycle, but tourism is actually a, a very important part of that as well, because it is a sustainable way of looking at funding a lot of these initiatives, which obviously took a big knock in the last year, but hopefully we'll return and hopefully we don't return to this situation anytime in our lifetimes if we can, you know, hold our thumbs on that. But one of the things you did in this time that we went through was Project Ranger. And can you tell us a little bit about that and how that affected the communities? Because that's obviously so important around everything that we do. Yeah, definitely. About a year ago, actually, we had a look at this and realized that this was going to be a two year cycle, at least. Um, and while we were okay, a lot of our guides converted into ranging and, and conservation frontline duties, monitoring, looking after rhinos, anti-poaching, all that sort of thing. But as we looked left and right, we saw national parks cutting off ranges, furloughing them, letting them go. And what that means is that those families of those rangers who are well-intentioned conservation frontline workers were going home and not being able to feed their families. So we started Project Ranger to basically average out and, and top up salaries. And uh, in the last year, we've raised just about, we're about just short of a million dollars now and distributed a million dollars to these ranges in, in seven or eight countries. So in Uganda, Mozambique, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, DRC, Kenya, um, and it, almost everywhere where Great Plains is not actually. Um, but it's fundamental because uh, as the poaching increases, we and we've seen massive poaching increases in the last year. We identified that early. But as that increases, we see a collapse in wildlife numbers and uh, a collapse in the communities that gain revenue from the tourism that rely on those wildlife numbers so that when tourism does return, if there's nothing there, we will continue to see a downward spiral um, and the collapse of these, these communities that we care so dearly about. And Johan, you have to know that what we're doing is really, um, it's like putting on a band-aid strip. Because when you look at how many ranges are right through Africa, uh, the number is about 40,000. And so we've started to see if we could at least reach 5,000 in the hotspots where the poaching is at the highest. Um, but, and, but how do you raise money in a pandemic when everybody is looking at the human issues and medicine and you know obviously supporting people to be able to um, have food on their, their table? And so it has been a challenge. It's an incredible, um, uh, you know, we had to be innovative is really the word I'm looking for to try and raise the money. And what we've done is we've used a lot of um, our arts um, to, to put that on the table. For instance, we created a, a project uh, in November, just before the Christmas period called Art for Rangers. And uh, we, we put out fine art images that 100% of those images, you know, would go straight to the ranger salaries. Um, or we've used our films. Uh, we've constantly um, looked at interesting ways. We found that there has been great support. Uh, conservation is key to the people that uh, love Africa um, right around the world and have traveled to Africa. Not everybody has had that privilege, but it, you know, it is just wonderful to see because ultimately it is really sponsoring a ranger, stopping a poacher and saving a species. So I think that's what we love about this whole project. It's working with the communities, protecting the environment and making sure that there will be a future. As Derek mentioned, you know, it's really uh, these areas are the last remaining pristine areas. 
And with the bushmeat that has escalated at such an alarming rate, uh, will there be anything to come back to? And that's what we're trying to make sure, is that these will still be the future bank of um, the loss of the, the wildlife um, in Africa. And the shocking thing about this, as we dug in deeper into it, is it doesn't cost very much, actually. We've, we've found out in different areas it costs, you know, different things. But for $500 a month, you keep a ranger and his family working. And, uh, you know, I think it's our collective responsibility. So. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that. I mean, I know what you say about uh, a Band-Aid over a serious wound, but I suppose, you know, somebody's got to do something, and you guys have certainly been instrumental in doing a lot in many different conservation spheres. So that's off to you. Um, but on that, uh, that note, I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about your Rhinos Without Borders. Um, I know that was an initiative that started a good couple of years back together with uh, and beyond. And, you know, I sort of lost track a little bit perhaps, but I know at the time you were looking to relocate at least 100 plus rhinos into the uh, sort of northern part of Botswana. Um, I suspect it's been successful. I know I did read recently somewhere that uh, maybe further to the south, there have been some, uh, some rhino poaching activity, but I'll, if you could just expand and tell us um, more about the Rhinos Without Borders project. Sure, you know, and it's ongoing. Um, we set, our, set ourselves a target to, to increase the rhino population in Botswana by 100 individuals. Um, and clearly we weren't going to be able to do that inside of Botswana, so we had to bring rhinos in. We then selected the highest poaching zones in South Africa to extract them from and move them to relative we thought safe, but relatively safe places in Botswana. So the status of that project now is that we moved 87 rhinos. Uh, so we did quite well against 100, but the real success is that we've had now, as of last week, uh, 60 babies born from those 80, 87. So we certainly did increase the number of runners there by more than 100. Um, there's been some attrition to runner poaching recently. The numbers vary, we're not sure how many, but we are tracking the, the 87 that we brought in, and I think we've lost 12 of those. So not too bad, not too bad generally. Um, any rhino lost is actually a, a travesty, but uh, I'm pleased that we did it. Um, and we worked really well with our collaborative partners there and beyond. Um, it was great. We went to a number of other industry partners and uh, when, and they all come in and I, and when we went to Joss Kent at and beyond, uh, I remember him saying to me, we had went out for a cup of tea and he said, uh, well, yeah, let's move a couple of runners. I said, no, we're gonna move a hundred runners. And he went, what? A hundred runners? Okay. Um, can I think about this? So I said, take all the time you need until you finish your cup of tea and then it's either a yes or no. Um, and it was a yes, which is great. And we've had a great relationship as a result of that. And, and of course, it's important, um, you know, to add that we continue to monitor these rhinos, um, especially, you know, right through this pandemic, it has been incredibly important uh, to follow through and watch what's happening. And that was part of the fundraising. We knew it was going to be expensive to relocate them. And that was, um, we wanted to relocate them by air so that the rhinos weren't going to be under stress for eight days or in traveling. It was going to be a, a short flight for them and then getting them into the, you know, in, in the bush, uh, in crates. Uh, but then to continue monitoring them over a three year period uh, was the 45,000 US in getting the individual rhino into the particular secret locations. Now, of course, as we move further away from those three years, we will constantly uh, do the monitoring. Uh, we're constantly doing training in the communities. And I, get, I think this is also important because education in the communities um, 
is the only way that we are going to protect these vast remaining lost wilderness areas. And I keep saying, you know, these are the last pristine areas. And they're not that pristine right now as we see the escalation of poaching. So having the rhino monitors out there and working very close, closely with the Botswana Defence Force um, and the Wildlife Department is the only way that we are going to see relative success. Derek mentioned that uh, we've probably lost about 12 of those rhinos, but the great success of the project was that we didn't lose one rhino in the relocation, uh, which just showed the dedication and passion of the team. Uh, the vets were phenomenal, everybody on the ground was phenomenal, and the utmost important was the protection of those rhinos. And that's the other thing about it, Vivi talks about skills and education, but um, we were able to, through this process, educate and give a lot of local vets hands-on experience about moving rhinos, which they would not normally have had. Um, and one so there are a couple of things around that. You were talking stats in the beginning, but the first rhino that we caught took us two and a half hours from, from when we identified it to dart in to down and to being contained. Um, then we got better and better and better at this until eventually the average time, that was two and a half hours, the average time was about 13 minutes from identifying rhino. And the, so the teams were, were working like clockwork. It was fantastic. The record that we got was nine minutes. And um, what was interesting about that one, we identified a rhino, dotted her, got her in, closed the container door. Everybody was going for the record, nine minutes. And I said, um, well, that's great, but what, what's that rhino doing out there? So we'd forgotten to close the front of the container. So she just walked straight out. So we're staying with a 13 minute record, not the nine minute record. <laughs> And of course, if anybody wanted to see a little bit um, or, or read about it, we just brought out a book last year. In America, it's called Blood Moon. And in South Africa, uh, Runners Without Borders Chasing the Blood Moon. And that's really about the four years of the rhino rescue and what is happening to rhinos. Brilliant. Well done. Congratulations. A little Most bit of like those rhinos in Botswana, do they have, um, they have guards and security looking after them or are they, they, they're pretty much free, free, free roaming? No, they're free roaming, all of them. But the, um, the rhinos that were there, now there have been a couple of programs over the, over the years and rhinos have bred up. And the, the origin of this was when I was talking to the former president, he said the national ambition was to get to 400 and they were falling short. And so we said, if we had 100 and they breed, we'll get to that 400. So there were rhinos in the country already. Um, and those are the ones that have largely been poached uh, up to this point. But they're in the wild and, they, and they're wandering around. They've been dehorned now. Uh, so there's no reason for anybody to come in and poach them, supposedly. Yeah, Eric I'm sorry. and Beverly, um, you know, we've all, I think over the last year, or perhaps a little bit longer, we've heard a lot about uh, the elephants primarily sort of up in the panhandle of Botswana, but I think there have been uh, instances also in Zimbabwe where they've been dying without uh, you know, much uh, indication as to what the cause behind their deaths were. But, uh, I'm sure you guys have probably got some insights as to what might have happened to those elephants, if you can share with us. I can talk to it a little bit without any science. Um, the, I've got an opinion and an impression, uh, but the science is still out. So there were certain uh, blood samples taken and then they were either inconclusive or got lost or, um, you know, we could learn nothing from them about the exact cause of death. Uh, that generally that kind of behavior at death uh, is associated with cyanide poisoning uh, whether and there are certain cyanides in the bush naturally but uh, it's, it's highly unlikely that out of um, 400,000 elephants that three or four hundred would cluster in one place and die without some sort of human intervention so I, I think that it was poisoning of some description so that uh, I've read about the algae in the water. You don't uh, you don't think that's such a plausible um, explanation? No, because we would have seen baboons, buffalo, everything else dying. As far as I understand, there was one horse that died, and then uh, and he could have died from anything, uh, and then all these elephants. So 
um, until it happens again, the, the jury is going to remain out on this one. That's sad that it happened, but fortunately, Botswana has been such a success story over the last you know, couple of decades that, you know, if we occasionally have to take a little step back like that, you know, hopefully in the future, you know, that would not happen. What's interesting, your story of capturing Rhino quicker and quicker reminded me of like, you know, assembling IKEA furniture. You know, the more you do it, the better you get. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the first one takes days or hours if you ever finish the project and then it gets better and better but uh, you mentioned communities and the importance of that in involving communities and we know it's such a critical part not just in Botswana and Kenya as well where communities are even closer to the wildlife and there's you know a lot larger numbers but along the lines of that uh, you sent nine women from rural Botswana to India and can you tell us a little bit about that and what was behind that and, and the, you know, why you did that? You know, Johan, um, Derek and I live a very simple rustic life when we're in the field. And so do the communities that are, are bordering all these national parks. So that means they're living off the grid. They don't have electricity at all. And so understanding um, and asking communities what they would like, obviously electricity um, was one of the huge um, positives that uh, they said, um, you know, they, they didn't know when it would come to them, but they would really like it. But they were really, you know, way um, away from um, all, the, all the local last um, electrical uh, sites. And so looking at um, a project, uh, Barefoot College, uh, we understood that we could send these ladies, we selected a group of ladies, and it really is a, a group of ladies that had immense passion to be able to assist their communities. They wanted to be empowered and they wanted to understand uh, business in every form. And of course, the Barefoot College only uh, looks at training women uh, and it's, it starts off with solar board electronics. So this is the reason why we chose them because they were going to be learning solar board electronics and they would be able to take power to the communities. Now we've got a number of very large uh, community villages. I think it's about five or six around all the areas, you know, that we're working in in Botswana. So that was our aim to choose one from all the areas and then assist them in being able to uh, put uh, the communities on, on, on solar and to be able to have light electricity. And then of course, to be able to um, be the engineers if there was going to be an issue, as well as learn other forms of business so that they could then assist and teach all the women right through those communities. You know, you know my, my sense of this, and it talks to many of the things that we're talking about here, is that um, we will never solve the, the conflict the human wildlife interface. We'll never solve that. We'll never solve the problems of Africa with regard to conservation unless we build a strong middle class and um, of people. Elephants are doing fine, of people. And we need to do whatever we can to raise up this middle class. And part and parcel of this is a pilot project like that, where we take people from a very, very low class give them the tools, give them the education, and then give them the nudge to create a burgeoning middle class where we can have real conversations about conservation. So, so that's, that's the startup project. And, and over the years to come, you'll, you'll hear this more and more from us. So how do we, how do we elevate people? We can't solve, solve world poverty, but how do we erode the decline into poverty of, of nearly 2 billion people? And we can do it by small examples like this, where we take a handful of women, fund them to go to India and come back and spread the good news about, about the middle class and, and how they can be looking after themselves. Thanks guys. Um, you know, I think without a doubt, I mean, COVID has, has changed the landscape enormously. And um, you know, we get a sense from our clients, I think more and more moving forward, people want to, experience um, sustainable tourism. They don't want to necessarily go to products that are 
uh, not in, in embracing that type of activity. And I think, uh, you know, COVID for, for, for what it's worth, I mean, that's probably been one of the, the upsides that it has brought out a lot of compassion and um, it's brought out some good in people. And uh, I think people want, when they travel, they want to be, make sure that they are supporting local communities and local initiatives and, um, you know, at the same time have engaging experiences, not just, you know, ticking things off their list, but um, that aside, I know you guys, um, obviously, you've got a good footprint in, in Kenya, but um, with the changes in the industry, what do you see as being, what do you think is going to work in Kenya moving forward? I think it's a, there, there's slight differences, Kenya, Botswana, Zimbabwe, but um, uh, what we're gearing up for in Kenya, because of its proximity to Europe and India in particular, is uh, we've built out and we, we've got four camps under construction right now. And we're building out for people who, we're already seeing this trend, coming in for longer stays. They want to, we've all found out that we can do webinars and, and hold business meetings on Zoom. And we've been saying to our, our guests uh, and people, repeat guests, uh, do you really want to be stuck in New York or Helsinki or Tokyo doing Zoom calls? Why don't you come out to the bush and do Zoom calls from there? So we've, we're gearing up for um, longer stays and we're starting to see people coming in for two or three weeks at a time in one camp. Um, where they can work, they don't have to go out every day. And so we started to promote slow travel instead of waking up at five, going out on a game, or rushing back for lunch, going out in the afternoon, um, take it easy and, and get to understand a leopard or a lion in that area. Uh, follow some elephants for the whole day. Meditate with the elephants as they're rumbling and talking. Um, there are things like that, that that I'm starting to see catching on. I also see people wanting to travel in a bubble. So hopping from camp to camp to camp to camp, you break in that bubble every now and again. So we've been seeing people wanting to come into Great Plains camps where our protocols are the same and transfer in our plane across to another Great Plains camp. Um, and so we're gearing up for that as well, including the travel and making sure that the travel is short hops are very, very secure and very safe and, and um, uh, you know, perfect for this sort of travel. And we've seen people wanting to travel with families more. And we've seen people, and I think uh, we will see more of this, people will do fewer trips a year and make the one or two that they do count, where they can give back, where they can go to a sustainable uh, company or one that's, that's involved in communities. Um, they want to we all want more meaning in our lives. And uh, I think coming out of this lockdown has really focused us on that reflection. Along those lines, I mean, how do the, the uh, Great Plains Foundation work together with the tourism side and the one benefit the other? Oh, um, uh, very much so. So it's, uh, within, the, within the tourism side of things, uh, we obviously have set our company up the other way around so that what the initiative, as I said earlier on, is to protect these vast tracts of land and the iconic species on them. And then basically what I did is I did a business model that said, this is how much it costs us to, to protect an acre of land and I'm getting you guys to pay for it. And so our rates are all done in reverse rather than saying, how much can I milk out of a rate? And that would be my profit because in Great Plains, um, I and our shareholders have said that we're not ever gonna take a profit. We're gonna recycle it back. And one third goes into communities, one third goes into conservation, and one third goes into growing that, that corridor up. So that's how the tourism feeds the conservation side of things. Um, many of our guests who come in uh, want to fund some of the conservation and foundation initiatives. And in fact, we charge a conservation levy group wires to feed that. Um, but as a result from our guests and, and people who haven't traveled to us who just help the foundation, we've been able to, on average, give away about $2.3 million a year into communities and conservation. So the two are in lockstep. And that's a huge contribution. I mean, that goes a long way in Africa in these you know, lower income communities. 
because I mean, especially in Kenya, I must see it as a race against time to get land under conservation and get communities to buy and benefit from the conservation. That's the only way they're going to buy into it and keep that land under conservation rather than going to alternatives like farming or, you know, making a living in, in some other way. Andrea. Yeah, so funny, um, yeah, Han, you mentioned, um, especially in Kenya. So we've managed to look at um, various projects in Kenya. And as I said earlier, it had to be innovative projects to be able to get the message across. And one of them is the Maasai Olympics. We've been involved in this now for 12 years. And the Maasai Olympics um, started with one of our grantees from the Big Cat Initiative at National Geographic. But to fund it, there was never going to be a, a, enough funding because we re really wanted it, you know, to have a huge way of reaching uh, the Maasai land area. So Great Plains Foundation has been heavily involved all the way. And every two years, uh, there's a Maasai Olympics. We've filmed every single one because we then wanted to be able to obviously share it with the world, but also for it to go to the rest of uh, the Maasai land areas that weren't involved. So for instance, um, in Tanzania and, and further afield, so that they could listen to a Maasai person tell the story. And I think that is important since the success of, um, I think after eight of them, 12. Yeah, so, so after eight of them, we interviewed a lot of the Maasai elders and the warriors and whoever was involved. And each and every uh, person said, we're not going to kill lions anymore. There's no way we're going to do a ritual killing, you know, to present to a bride. We would rather be this athlete um, that has shown and, and, you know, gone through the testosterone, whatever it is a young warrior has to do. Um, and, and when the prize um our women think more highly of us than giving them a smelly tail uh, and so you know i think um when we look at these projects we've got to um, look out of the box each time because it's not about lecturing it's about the communities taking part and they um are going to be the ambassadors for the future. And right now, they are, um, are doing the work. Sadly, the pandemic uh, stopped the last um, Messiah Olympics, but we're hoping that we'll be able to get it back on um, as soon as the pandemic is over. And the other thing about that um, is these things are not seen in isolation. And we we believe in collaboration. As we spoke earlier on, working with and beyond, Joss Kent and those guys, um, we work with the Big Laugh Foundation. We work with many, many foundations and, and, and tourism organizations around the world. Um, we have to be collaborative and we have to be integrated as well. We have to think about that it's not just lions, it's not just tourism. Um, and I said this to a group of, of Maasai warriors, 10,000 warriors, uh, a couple of years ago, where I said, this is all the Maasai Olympics is all about having a healthy mind in a healthy body in a healthy environment. And if you don't have those three working together, you're working individually and, and you never find pure health for the planet. Amazing work. Um, Derek and Beverly, you've, you've alluded to some of your plans in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in um, Kenya. And um, just in terms of future plans for the region, I know You've got SAPI on the cards in Zimbabwe, and uh, you've got some new experiences uh, lined up for Botswana. Can you perhaps elaborate a bit on those, those two items? Yeah, sure. So um, let's talk about Zimbabwe and SAPI for now. <clears throat> the builders are in there right now, and they're building out Tembo Plains, which will be, uh, I don't love the star rating, but it's, a, it's five star. It's our reserve collection which is the highest grade, which matches with Zarafa and Duba and Mara Plains Camp and Mara Nika, Aldania. So it's, it's up there for us. Um, but Timber Plains is, is just spectacular. I was writing about it today because it's built in these thick trees, canopy trees, and you look down over a little floodplain onto the Zambezi. Um, and when we were there sighting the camp, uh, we had to back off quite quickly because a herd of elephants came in and then just all went down to sleep on the site. 
And so that sort of dictates how, how we build. So we built a camp up on stilts so elephants can still come through underneath. Uh, but Tembo, meaning elephants, of course, uh, is a project underway right now, a small camp for, you know, 12 beds. Um, and then across in, uh, in Botswana, we are building a camp starting near the end of this year called Sidatunga Island, which is up in the Okavango. And basically the design for that, also probably 12 beds, is uh, these Bayer fishing baskets. Uh, we're building the rooms like giant fishing baskets hanging out of the trees. Um, and when the storms come, you can all switch rooms, you know. That's, but uh, uh, no, the, so we're having a bit of fun with that design. But one of the new things that we're about to announce, and I'm happy to announce to this group, is that we start in Great Plains Nomadics, which is a, a mobile experience that um, will start in Duba area, then head up by canoe onto the road, then up through the entire cylinder concession uh, in ex equip equipped expedition vehicles, uh, stopping along the way for a couple of nights, primarily so that we can count elephants along that cylinder spillway in the dry season. Um, we want to do regular trips, regular counts, compare notes to the aerial surveys, the moonlight counts, and various other research and conservation initiatives that we have going. And then before you get to Kenya, um, we did a film um, a couple of years ago called Soul of the Elephant. And that's exactly what Derek and I did. We were on these canoes and we were going up the cylinder spillway. Obviously it was the right time of the year, the cylinder spillway joined the Okavango water and the cylinder, well, the Kondo water, you know, coming in. And it is truly, um, it's adrenaline filled, it's exciting in every way. Um, but at the same time, it's reflective and meditative. So to be able to be so silent, um, moving, on water and observing whatever's happening around you is uh, probably the best experience you can ever um, have because you don't have the engine of anything else. Um, you are in charge, you are the power. And the animals somehow um, don't see you. You become invisible, um, you know, on the river, as long as obviously we're respectful, which I think is, is important in everything that we all do when we're out amongst animals to have the respect towards them. But that is, um, I would say, uh, a highlight. Uh, and for Derek and I, you know, to have these experiences and still see um, something like that as a highlight, you have to know that um, it's ultimate in every way. A number of years ago, <clears throat> Beverly and I were off in the bush together and, uh, and you said to me, I've just looked into the eyes of extinction. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were sitting with a, a big family of gorillas. And, um, and so we're looking into a great apes experience right now as well. So we'd be adding that to our portfolio within the next six months to a year. And then right. going back, um, sorry, Andre, um, Derek did mention um, uh, Sapi and, and the Temba area. And we're doing exactly what we did in the Salinda area from day one of taking over that um, uh, conservancy uh, or concession, is the way you, you refer to it, um, unlike in Kenya, uh, we stopped the hunting. And so we've allowed uh, the animals to come back. And often it is a slow process. And in other areas, it's not that slow because um, of the Zambezi, all that water. And so, you know, all the animals are coming rushing in again. In Salinda, we really appreciated the change over a six year period. And I suspect we'll probably see the same in Sapi. And we've had Sapi now for four, three years here. Well, that's, that's very exciting what you're telling us there. Um, you know, I think without a doubt, uh, COVID has, has changed the world around us and um, it's been an incredibly frustrating and challenging period. But um, the one thing Africa does well and uh, you know, pl plays into that space is the fact that we have an abundance of wide open areas and you know, people can escape. They can escape to nature where they're surrounded by the wind and the stars and the 
close sunlight and, and, and we've got an abundance of private intimate places and certainly within Great Plains, you guys have got many, you know, whether it's a family traveling together or a group of friends, you can, you, you can get into that bubble. You can, you can stay in your own little intimate private space and feel, feel completely safe. And you've spoken about various aspects, but is there anything perhaps you would like to draw some of our audience's attention to in terms of within your Great Plains portfolio, what, what are you doing differently or, you know, what, what clients can expect um, coming, going into the future when they come and stay at your lodges? Yeah, definitely. You know, I think that you're right. You've stated it well. I think that we have, we have a couple of great assets in, in Africa. One is obviously the great open spaces, the clean, fresh air. That in itself is cleansing. Um, but there's a, there's a secret weapon that we have, and that is the people. We have some of the most hospitable people in the world. And um, I hope that we've selected some of them in Great Plains. And one of my concerns uh, was that coming out of this era, that there would be an erosion of that hospitality. And I often say that we're in the hospitality business, not in the hospital business. So we've got to be careful about over masking and you know doing all that hazmat suits and all that sort of thing. Um, and so we developed COVID protocols that are very, very stringent actually. Um, and then we went through a phase of training on this, particularly for the hospitality version of that. Um, and some of the training I'll tell you has been about how to smile with your eyes because if you've got a mask on nobody can see whether you're happy or sad and those those great African smiles that we all yearn for and love are now hidden and so smiling with those eyes has been critical um, and then I was interested to know that we, when we went into camp recently how all of this would play out and in typical you know, African style, they, all the staff took the protocols, they did them to a T, they carried out their training, and then they, then they, they put some lovely veneer onto them, some patina onto them. And a good example is um, in our camps, when you wake up in the morning, you go through, there's a, a temperature check, a little thermometer, you know, it's fairly standard. And we do that four times a day and it becomes routine. It becomes fun, actually. In fact, you write it down and you show it to the guests and everybody's like tracking their own temperature. But what the mass I have done in our camps is instead of this white temperature thermometer thing, they've beaded it. So now it's a mass I beaded with beads dripping off it. And it's, you know, they've, they've made it their own, a little bit like, like your own shirt. Um, and so that's, it's, I love the fact that, that it's fine. Um, of course, in camp, what you can expect to see that you may not have before is that we've, we've broken up private dining. We've always been really um, accommodating or, or good at, at giving you dining in different places every day. And so we have built for that. And so we have people dining in, on their decks or in a sunset spot or in the wine cellar or in the lounge or, or out on the lawn. So there, there's all of that, it's all outdoor. And the protocols are seamless. And I think that's what I like most about it. They don't get in the way. And then to add to that, um, especially through this time, but I believe um, there's been a movement even before the pandemic to have a healthy body, healthy mind, healthy body, healthy environment, as Derek had mentioned um, to the Messiah. But in today's time, we find that many people um, are being a lot more conscious of what they're doing to the planet. And everything that we do is how can we help the planet further? We've gone completely plant-based. You know, ve vegetarianism, um, we felt wasn't enough. We needed to really look at um, every other aspect. And we find that around the world, many people have gone plant-based. So we've created a plant-based menu as well. So it's to have choices. Um, our chefs have been uh, trained over this last year in, in the plant-based um, so that we can still give you incredible cuisine 
but plant-based. So not that you're feeling like, oh, you've gone to a health farm and you're gonna starve. It's not that at all. Um, and then of course, everything um, that you said earlier, Andre, is um, how can um, the future travelers uh, be more conscientious? Um, have really understand uh, where you're going to, um, who is assisting uh, communities, um, just that conscientious aspect really is going to help. If you look at uh, 2019, there was a $50 billion industry in tourism. And of course, over 2020, it pretty much went down to zero because of the pandemic. And so to help that come back. Uh, many uh, tourists have been saying, well, now I'm really um, too nervous to travel, not only the pandemic, but I'm also, you know, looking at um, uh, air travel around the world. And that would be the wrong thing to do, to just stop. That $50 billion industry, the only way it's going to be successful in protecting the areas in Africa is for tourism to start again, but it needs to be conscientious tourism. We don't want to go back to all the bad ways and um, assist governments um, in wanting to keep those areas alive. And, and this plant-based diet, so what we're finding is that the grazing, the grass grazing around our camps is cut down now because all our guests are eating grass. <laughs> Um, and so there's, it's much safer in camps now than it was. Um, but actually, what it's really all about is um, is honouring the moment. I think that you know you can you can steal somebody's money, you can uh, steal their car, whatever it is. But the biggest crime of all is stealing somebody's time. And when somebody comes on a safari with great planes, the the one thing that you will probably get in trouble for as a staff member is wasting somebody's time. Time is one thing that we can, none of us can ever get back again. And so it's a bit of a mantra there. If you keep somebody waiting or you um, have them in the vehicle while you've forgotten your binoculars and you're in, that's, that's, a, that's something that we don't tolerate. So, so being, if, if we're respecting your time, um, we're also respecting what you put in your body, the wine you drink, um, and all of those sorts of things. But let me talk for a moment about the wine. As we, and we will announce this to the trade as well. We are um, at the moment having. We've just concluded a, an arrangement with a with a big winemaker and a big supplier, who is um, curating our wine experience, so that in all, each one of our reserve camps. We will have a featured winemaker, winemaker's wine. So, for example, if you go to Zarafa, it may be Kevin Arnold's finest wines there, and, and there will be wine pairings, and there will be discussion around Kevin Arnold's wine. We'll even get bottles that don't have labels on yet, so his private selection. Um, and then when you go down to, say, Duba, there will be another winemaker's wine there, so that... Um, so that it's featured, so that you make something of it and you don't waste your time just clugging down red or white wine. It's, it's, we've got to respect our bodies, we've got to respect each other, we've got to respect the planet. I mean, that's so great to hear about those initiatives and also to hear about all the exciting new things happening with Great Plains and I yeah, can't wait to hear a, a little bit more about that in the next little while. Uh, as Brooke and I also experienced in the last year, you know, traveling over this, these times of COVID, you know, we, I felt safer in Africa, literally, well, no, you know, safer than going to, I used the example of safer than going to a grocery store, but obviously it's a bad example for Boulder mm -hmm. at the moment, but, you know, just in general COVID related. And, you know, the way I quantified it was the safari, it, the, the, the large experience is, you know, 98, 99% of what it always was. Yeah, you wash your hands a little bit, you take the temperature, but I mean, that doesn't really take much away from that beautiful experience you have out there. And then in some parts of Africa, you know, a place like Salinda or the Spillway, I mean, that's always exclusive and private. And it's always a great experience, but there are parts of Africa that gets a little busier, like, like up in Kenya, for instance, in the Mara. And there the safari is like 200% of what it normally is. This is actually a period for connoisseurs to 
you know, get out there, you know, before everyone returns. And, you know, we all, obviously the light sort of at the end of the tunnel of everyone returning. So I just wanted to bring up a couple of the questions that was uh, put in the Q&A box. And if any of you online have any more, just put them in there for me, please. Um, so Derek and Beverly, uh, this comes from a travel advisor who specializes in Africa asking, how do I get the message out about conservation, especially to the first time guests to Africa? How do I get the consumer interest in conservation, interested in conservation and letting them know by going on safari, they are making a difference? Right. Well, it's the, it's the biggest question really about communication. Um, we've, for the last year, when we all went into lockdown, I gathered the team around and I said, our first thing that we got to do is make sure everybody's safe. The second is communicate. As people are, are incarcerated in their own homes, apartments, whatever it might be, they're going to feel cut off. And we need to keep that line of communication open. And, and so every Wednesday we send, we send out a mailer and it'll be a missive about an elephant that we saw and, and what the meaning of elephants is or woman and how important these Great Plains lionesses are, the woman in Great Plains are to us or the guides or whatever it might be. It's keeping that, that uh, communication going. We are from three and a half million years ago, distinguished from other uh, primates has been the communicating act. When we, when we stood upright and we developed this, we were able to talk and create language. And when that's taken away from us, we suffer. And so communication is vitally important. And so I would say, uh, if you want to take our, our newsletters and, and strip off our names and put your name on, we're happy to do that. Just communicate, communicate, communicate. Because the worst thing uh, coming out of this is that people become fearful of travel in general and stop coming to Africa and cut off that $50 billion a year ecotourism revenue into Africa that Beverly was talking about. And the ripple effects of that, which are significant because when travel stops, conservation stops, when conservation and travel stop, communities fail. When communities fail, they poach and they lean on local governments for, for funding. And when that fails, they go out to the West or to the East and they ask for for aid and, and immediately, depending on what administration's in at the time, that's viewed kindly or viewed as um, Africans come in with a, with a basket again. And uh, that breeds xenophobia and racism. So the tourism that your clients and your, your circle are buying into has a greater effect than just what they leave behind in Africa. It is, it, it's important. And when people come and sit around the fire in Maasai land, they are less likely to go home or not to come and to, and to judge that Maasai warrior that they've just shared the fire with. Um, put, you're putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. And I think in many ways, that's the greatest value of tourism. It erodes xenophobia. So we've got to communicate that. And then I do believe that, um, you know, we've, we've all got to look at the stats and if they want to send um, their clients to look at the Big Cat Initiative, when you look at 50 years ago, there were 450,000 lines, they're less than 20,000 now, they're less than 7,000 cheetah. And once you understand uh, the alarming decline, and it really is, uh, pretty much a 95% decline. Um, it's impossible for um, any guest not to understand that we are moving animals to extinction. You, it goes back to what Andres um, read earlier, um, you know, the stat of 4%, uh, 4% of land on our planet is for wildlife. So we really do have to act now to be able to protect that 4% and hopefully uh, we'll even be able to grow onto that 4%. So, and, and, and embedded in that question is actually something else that, that stimulates me to, to answer. The, um, the big conservation issues can be um, clustered into three. One would be greed. So people are going out, they, they're killing animals because they're greedy largely. Um, uh, 
necessity. They're going out and, and eroding these wild places because they have to eat. Um, but the other is, is ignorance. And we need to fight each one of these. We need to fight ignorance with knowledge and fact. And that, that slips into that, that communication. Let's talk to as many people as we can, saying that uh, whatever we've been talking about here, that tourism done in the right way is vitally important to conservation. That is so important. Uh, a quick question on the side. I think it came in a little bit earlier when we were talking about Botswana. Was just someone wanted to uh, ask the, uh, whether the poaching that's happening is killing for survival in terms of sustenance or for monetary profit? Yeah, so, so what we found during the entire uh, COVID lockdown period, in the very, very beginning, we saw bushmeat starting, you know, the bushmeat trade starting to ramp up. Um, but we host a, an international wildlife trafficking forum every week. Uh, it's an investigation group. And the news out of that, first of all, is that it's devastating. The second is that it's highly highly organized transnational crime. There's obviously a bit of poaching going on for the Impala or whatever it might be, but even bushmeat is being bundled and sold across border and internationally. And within the bushmeat is rhino horn and ivory, um, but also linked to jade, timber, drugs, arms, human trafficking, all bundled into the same with the same, the same suspects. Uh, involved in all of them. So this is not local communities going out and feeding themselves. This is highly organized now. Yeah, that's a sad consequence of our uh, of the times, unfortunately. And, you know, it's an ongoing fight uh, that, you know, stands between us and so many of our conservation goals. And we'll continue walking, you know, that journey and fighting that fight. Um, last two questions just quickly is uh, when Someone was asking when would nomadic journeys begin and almost not quite related, but similar in a similar line is what forms can we look forward to in the future? <laughs> okay, well, Derek can answer the nomadic journeys. <laughs> films, if you're allowed. <laughs> so, so, so absolutely films. Um, we actually have taken on quite a lot um, through the pandemic, uh, obviously we're stationary, we're in our mission control, what we've been calling it. And, uh, and so we've um, escalated our post-production. I mean, our, our best is to be out in the field. But through post-production this year, uh, we are re-looking at six of our older films from the 80s and 90s. A lot of people have spoken about Eternal Enemies and various other ones. And, and now looking at how we can re-release them, but bring them into new technology and obviously what is happening in those areas right now. So that is... Um, I, I sort of... On the, that's, that's the like edit... A, yeah, it's a Jabir... <laughs> Big Cats Showcase. Yeah. Um, we, uh, before the pandemic, we had started filming Cheetahs. Um, and these are the Cheetahs that are in the OMC, uh, which is just bordering uh, the Maasai Mara. Um, it is going to be the first time that Derek and I have filmed Cheetahs. I mean, we've always uh, looked at the big cats, but um, this is our first foray into Cheetahs, which has been a phenomenal experience. And that should come out, I suspect, um, at the Big Cat Week uh, at the end of the year with National Geographic. Well, let me comment on that. As a cameraman, lesson is Cheetahs are quite fast. <laughs> so, who knew? <laughs> Okay, carry on. <laughs> and, and then the um, eighth one, which is a mammoth task. Uh, uh, the creature is rather large itself. And that is really on Blood Moon. I spoke about the book that we brought out and you asked the question about the relocation of those rhinos. Uh, it is really a docky feature. Uh, very powerful because it's very emotional. It's very emotional hearing it, uh, you know, from each person that was involved in helping with the relocation and then seeing um, rhinos that have been wounded and these rhinos were given a second chance. 
And the second part of the question, um, nomadics, when can we start, when are we going to be seeing taking Brookings uh, Great Plains nomadics? Um, I believe the date is 1st of August. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. I, you know, I honestly don't know how you guys do it. It seems like either you have like 40 hours a day, you know, to still be able to film and do the, all these different aspects, or you're as well organized as my wife and just able to pack it in and, <laughs> and do it all right. So, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, kind of brings us towards the end. I think we've answered all the questions. Uh, thank you so much for your time. You know, there's been a couple of comments in the chat box. It was so nice to see it about everyone just loving the passion with which you speak of all your conservation efforts and for, of, you know, how, you know, we go forward and how do we make Africa a better place and preserve what's there and increase, you know, everything along the lines. Um, of course, you know, I'm here in the US if you have any questions on different things as well. I will send out the recording of this tomorrow as well. And Andre and the Trans Africa team, you know, based in Cape Town, we love supporting entities that do good in Africa, entities like Great Plains that makes a difference on the ground. And of course, can take care of all the logistics and handle it, you know, from start to finish. So with that, uh, you know, I just again wanted to thank you for your time and thank you everyone for tuning in and listening to this and feel free to share the recording with your colleagues. It, it was such a lovely discussion. I really want to thank everyone and, you know, hopefully we'll all be able to get together at some stage soon and yeah. raise one of those Kevin Arnold glasses of wine and appreciate yeah. it and enjoy that. Thank you yeah, so and much. From my side, I just want to say, uh, obviously, a big thank you. Thank you to all the advisors listening in and especially big thank you to Beverly and Derek. I mean, it's, I know your time is precious and you, as Johan says, you've got a, you've got a very busy diary, but you know, we salute you and all your conservation initiatives. I mean, Africa needs, um, needs people like you now more than ever before. And, um, you know, not enough can be said about, you know, it's not often I think, well, I suppose there are some, some out there, but I think you guys are very, blessed in the fact that you you do tremendous good work, but you also present so fantastically well. You know, you come across with such passion and, um, and belief. And, you know, to put Africa and um, your various concerns on the world stage, I think, is, is just a beautiful thing. And, um, yeah, I mean, we thank you for it. And uh, thank you for joining us this evening. And thanks again to Johan for for hosting it on his platform and um and thank you to all the advisors and stay well and let's hope the business bounces back very soon well, thank, thank you, you very thank much you. it's been great to be here with all of you um i did see a comment go up there and thankfully i misread it i thought it said absolutely rubbish but it said absolutely fantastic so thank you Peg. um but we can't do this without all of you and, and the collaboration. And so uh, we have a big task. We have a lot of work ahead and we can only do it if we all do it together. So thanks for inviting us on today. Thank you. Yeah, we're all Thank in this guys. together. We'll make it work. Thanks so much. Good. Good. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.